In the previous talk in this series on Socratic method, I focused on the elenchus, which is the substantial core of Socrates' philosophical activities, as depicted in the so-called early or Socratic dialogues by Plato. In those dialogues, we see Socrates employing the refutational procedure of the elenchus with various knowledge claimants as his interlocutors. Inconsistencies and even outright contradictions come to the surface and have the effect of plunging these erstwhile experts into a state of perplexity called in Greek aporia. This perplexity is a subjective state in which the interlocutor comes to realize that he does not actually have the kind of knowledge he began by so confidently claiming for himself. Aporia is a very large and complex philosophical topic in its own right, but in this video we'll only be talking about the role of aporia in the early or Socratic dialogues. Aporia in these early dialogues is shown primarily as a subjective state of perplexity. However, some instances of it point towards a more objective sense in which aporia can exist. On the one hand, someone may be puzzled about X, so the subjective sense. But on the other hand, there really may be a puzzle about X, and that would be the objective sense. For now, though, I want to leave aside the objective and positive dimensions of aporia to focus only on the subjective experience of this state and how the various interlocutors deal with it, or rather, do not deal with it. Socrates employs the elenchus to purge his interlocutor of their conceit of knowledge, which is not only good for them, but is also a necessary condition for any inquiry to take place. As long as I am convinced that I have knowledge of X, I am hardly going to take up an inquiry into X. For instance, if I am convinced that my house key is in my right jacket pocket, because that's where it always stays when not in use, I'm hardly going to go searching for it. So too, if I am convinced that I have knowledge of a particular moral concept, say, like courage, I'm not going to conduct an inquiry into the nature of courage. We start to sense, then, that aporia might be essential for motivating inquiry. Now, this is no mere academic exercise. Thinking that I know something when I don't can have profound negative and even dangerous consequences. For instance, Euthyphro, in the dialogue that bears his name, is quite convinced that he is an expert on theology and the will of the gods, and on the basis of this conviction, he is about to initiate a prosecution against his own father for impiety. Pursuing such a course of action, even if justified, is likely to cause serious divisions within his family, perhaps irreconcilable rifts, and, ironically, if he is wrong about this proposed course of action, he will himself be guilty of a form of impiety. Socrates is aghast at this announcement, and his employment of the elenchus could be interpreted not just as a purging of the conceit of knowledge in Euthyphro, but as an emergency intervention to save him from following a potentially family-wrecking course of action. The elenchus aims to purge the interlocutor of their conceit of knowledge. So what effect does a successful elenchus produce in the interlocutor, and how do they take this refutation of their cherished so-called knowledge? Do they eat humble pie and dedicate themselves to genuine inquiry? Or do they dig their heels in and double down on their untenable theories? Or do they react in some other less than constructive way? As we read these dialogues, we see very few, if any of them, will even acknowledge their own ignorance in a straightforward and unambiguous way, let alone show any desire to initiate an inquiry. It is surely part of Plato's literary genius that he depicts in these philosophical dramas not just the flaws in the account of X offered by the interlocutors, and then of the elenctic purging of the conceit of knowledge that follows, but he also shows us the various reactions these different characters display in the moment in which the conceit is both revealed and purged, and how they handle it. The manner in which they react to this reveals much about the character of the interlocutor. The elenchus, then, is not just a test of knowledge, but a test of character. Ideally, the desired response to an elenchus should be an urgent desire to fill this newly opened vacuum of knowledge about X with a genuine inquiry into X. But do the interlocutors actually show any clear positive signs of this desire for knowledge? On the face of it, the answer must be no. But does this mean the elenchus is ineffective as a refutational procedure, or does it mean that his interlocutors are not made of the right stuff necessary for the pursuit of philosophy? Now, these dialogues are fictions, 
They are not transcripts of discussions that actually took place between the historical Socrates and his historical interlocutors. So the question we ought to be asking is this. Why does Plato, the author, show us again and again interlocutors who fail to take up the task of genuine inquiry in the wake of their own refutation and entry into the state of Aporia? What is Plato trying to show us here? Now, some of these interlocutors, when they enter into this state of Aporia, tend to blame Socrates for their perplexity. Here's two examples, one from the Euthyphro, the other from the Mino. In the Euthyphro, the character Euthyphro began by making big claims for himself as a theologian and one with special insights into the will of the gods. Quote, Socrates speaking, But by Zeus, Euthyphro, do you believe that you understand divine matters in relation to holiness and unholiness so precisely that you are not afraid, given the circumstances you are describing, of performing a further unholy action yourself by bringing your father to justice? Euthyphro. Socrates, I would be useless indeed, and Euthyphro would not be different from anybody else if I did not have precise knowledge of all such matters. End quote. However, this confidence will soon take a bruising as the Elenchos reveals serious problems in his account of piety, the central topic of the dialogue. A number of efforts to redefine piety will come to naught, and in sheer frustration, Euthyphro will attempt to blame Socrates for his newfound perplexity about piety. Quote, Euthyphro, but Socrates, I don't know how to tell you what I have in mind, for anything we propose always wanders about somehow and won't stay where we put it. Socrates, these pronouncements of yours, Euthyphro, seem to be like the works of my own ancestor Daedalus, and if I was the one who had proposed them and set them down, you would probably have mocked me over my kinship to that man, because my verbal formulations run away and refuse to remain where someone puts them. But now, of course, the hypotheses are yours, so some alternative mockery is called for, since they refuse to remain in place for you, as you can see for yourself, Euthyphro. But I think the pronouncements deserve more or less the same mockery, Socrates, for I am not the one who sets them in motion, so that they don't remain in the same place. No, it seems to me that you are the Daedalus, since if it were up to me, they would have remained as they were. End quote. Before moving on, I should explain the Daedalus reference. So Daedalus is a Greek mythic character who had the ability to animate statues. He was also the father of the better-known Icarus, who flew too close to the sun. Socrates calling him his ancestor is an ironic reference to his own father, who was a stonemason. Now, in this passage, there are a number of points of interest. One, despite the failure of all his attempts to define piety and the evident impasse they have reached, Euthyphro will only admit that he is unable to say what he still presumably claims to know. He is, as it were, in a state of aporia, but will not admit that that is what it is. 2. The argument is inconstant. Euthyphro is all over the place. Nothing seems to hang together. Socrates compares Euthyphro to Daedalus, his argument being likened to moving statues. And 3. Socrates reminds Euthyphro that all the premises are his own which satisfies the condition he imposes on himself, that is to say, only premises introduced by the interlocutor can be used in the elenchos. So see part two of this series for a discussion of this particular issue. And finally, four, Euthyphro blames Socrates for the instability of his argument by saying that they would remain as they were if it were up to him. This last point is quite remarkable, for he is in effect saying that all the challenges his claim met and to which he responded were as nothing, for he still tacitly holds to his original definition, or at least that he would like it to stand. I think this indicates a few things. On the face of it, it shows the depth of attachment people have to their opinions, even in the face of a refutation they themselves cooperated in, and which only used their own premises. This would seem to imply a certain lack of trust in reason itself. This is a topic which is touched on in several places in Plato's writings, a general tendency to mistrust rational arguments, largely due to inexperience in reasoning. Sometime later, I, I will produce a video on this particular issue. But now, let's move on to the next example of an interlocutor's experience of aporia and their response to it. 
In the dialogue Mino, it begins rather abruptly with Mino posing this question to Socrates. Can virtue, that's to say moral excellence, be taught? Socrates discombobulates Mino immediately by raising the following difficulty. I cannot know whether or not it can be taught until I first know what it is. As teachability is a property, in this case of virtue, the question cannot be answered as long as we lack knowledge of what virtue itself is. We simply can't say whether it's teachable or not. We pick it up here in the wake of the Elenchus, which has left Mino in a state of aporia about the nature of virtue itself. Socrates suggests rebooting the inquiry after Mino's failed attempts at defining virtue itself. Socrates speaking, quote, Then answer once more from the beginning, what do you say that excellence is? End quote. Mino replies with a lengthy speech in which he speaks of his aporia and what he takes to be its cause. He says that Socrates is renowned for both being in aporia and for inducing it in others. He characterizes this induction as a form of sorcery, enchanting and bewitching me, perhaps even casting spells, as the effect on Mino is a state of total aporia. He compares Socrates to the torpedo fish, which paralyzes its prey through proximity, as if he were some kind of predator, roaming around inducing aporia in others, but with the implication that just as the fish is not itself paralyzed, Socrates is not himself in aporia. Socrates is quick to correct him by accepting the comparison, only if it is understood that Socrates himself is in greater aporia than his interlocutors. Quote, For I do not make other people perplexed while being well endowed myself. No, I make other people perplexed while being even more perplexed than anyone myself. End quote. Unlike Euthyphro, Mino is at least willing to admit that he is indeed in a state of aporia about the nature of virtue. He explicitly admits that, unlike previously, he is now unable to even say what virtue is. Mino does seem to be more honest about being in a state of aporia than Euthyphro, who, despite his admitted speechlessness, still claims to know what piety is right to the bitter end. However, both of them are inclined to blame Socrates for their perplexity over those things they had claimed expertise. Mino even warns Socrates that were he to do what he does in a place where he was not known, he would likely be charged with sorcery. If the Elenkos is a test of a person's epistemic claims, the newfound experience of aporia as a result of a successful Socratic Elenkos is also a test of character. For Socrates, the state of aporia is what motivates his all-consuming search for knowledge. But for people like Euthyphro and Mino, their reaction to aporia is just to blame Socrates. By blaming Socrates for their aporia and the distress that accompanies it, they effectively disavow responsibility for their own overestimation of their epistemic condition. They seem more attached to their own cherished opinions than they are to the actual truth of the matter. No genuine inquiry can take place as long as there is this kind of attachment. So far, this is pretty much the conventional understanding of the effect of the Lenkus and the aporia on the interlocutors in these early or Socratic dialogues. There is an alternative view, and I'd like to turn to discuss that now. In his book, Cross-Examining Socrates, A Defense of the Interlocutors in Plato's Early Dialogues, published in 2000, John Beversless presents an unorthodox but challenging thesis in which Socrates is actually the villain. Beversless describes Socrates' treatment of his interlocutors, or victims, variously as demeaning, often unkind, occasionally cruel, predatory, but perhaps most damning of all, just ineffective. His criticism is summarized uh, thus, and here he's uh, speaking about a dialogue called the Laches, which is about courage. Quote, Does the aporia to which they, that is the arguments in the Laches, lead, infuse anyone with self-knowledge? If so, it has eluded me. The Laches reveals that although the Socratic Olenkus can expose ignorance, defined in Socratic terms. It can neither provide knowledge nor motivate the ignorant, again defined in Socratic terms, to search for it. In the end, everyone remains exactly as they were. Aporia there is, in the Carmides, another dialogue, but its effects are the very opposite of those envisaged in the Apology. No one is seized by his ignorance and impelled to take up the philosophical quest. End quote. 
On this view, if the aim of the elenchos is to remove the conceit of knowledge and motivate genuine inquiry, an understanding of the elenchos that has plenty of textual support from the Apology as well as certain passages in other Socratic dialogues, then Socrates has failed according to his own stated criteria. Although Beverslus does concede that the elenchos is effective in exposing the conceit of knowledge, that's about as far as it goes. This much is indisputable. The Socratic dialogues depict more or less successful elenchoi and end aporetically, but none of the interlocutors seem to take up the challenge to engage in genuine inquiry, and everything remains exactly as it were before the elenchos was employed. As readers, we would need to explain why there seems to be this universal failure to produce inquirers, despite this being one of the major stated aims of the whole process. Beverslus provides his own explanation. Recall the first video in this series, where I briefly discussed the conventional scholarly division of Plato's works into early, middle and late. This division is associated with the developmentalist interpretation of Plato, that is, his writings display his own philosophical development over his life, as opposed to the Unitarian view, according to which, when he took up his philosophical writing, he was already clear in his own mind as to what his basic commitments were. On the developmentalist view, the early dialogues are more or less faithful reconstructions of his great mentor Socrates, a kind of portrait in speech. I should add that this understanding of these dialogues is also compatible with the Unitarian position. But according to developmentalism, the middle period is marked by a growing tendency for Plato to speak through Socrates as he develops his own philosophy. Now Socrates is just becoming the mouthpiece of Plato, a kind of hand puppet. Beverslus explains this transition as follows, quote, The Socrates portrayed in the early dialogues is a Socrates with whom Plato came to have deep philosophical, methodological and educational disagreements. In arriving at his final estimate, he took Socrates' interlocutors very seriously. So should we. End quote. This is an interesting and provocative explanation for the transition from the early or Socratic dialogues to the middle period works, and while for present purposes I won't take a stand either way on Beverslus' thesis, nevertheless what seems incontrovertible is the fact that in these early or Socratic dialogues we never see any of the interlocutors becoming genuine inquirers as a result of their aporia induced by the Socratic elenchos. This negative result stands in need of explanation, for it is an aim of the elenchos that by removing the conceit of knowledge, the interlocutor will be motivated to become an inquirer. Yet this does not happen. To be clear, the elenchos does succeed in exposing the conceit of knowledge and thereby inducing aporia, but it fails to motivate the interlocutors to become inquirers. For Beverslus, it is this failure to motivate interlocutors to become inquirers which indicates a shortcoming in the elenchos as Socrates practices it, and on this point it would be hard to dispute that particular point with him. But then how do we explain this motivational failure? Well, Beverslus believes that it comes down to a certain lack of what we might call psychological discernment on the part of Socrates. He applies the elenchos as a kind of one-size-fits-all method to all those he encounters, and this is not only ineffectual, but potentially dangerous. Dangerous because the elenchos can harm the interlocutor. Now, this is a very serious charge to level against the Socrates of the early dialogues, not least because Socrates' own stated intentions for practising the elenchos, as articulated in the Apology, was to improve the spiritual and moral condition of his fellow citizens. In the Apology, Socrates says this, quote, I went to each person individually, where I was going to confer the greatest benefit possible, as I declare, by trying to persuade each of you to care first and foremost for himself, rather than anything that belongs to himself, so that he might be as good and as wise as possible. End quote. So Socrates understands what he's doing as some sort of procedure whereby he will be, make people better and as wise as possible. But if Beverslus's interpretation of these early dialogues is the right one, then far from improving his interlocutors, he may even have been harming them. This is how Beverslus puts it in the concluding chapter of his book. Quote, By the time he wrote the Gorgias, Plato had come to believe that the Socratic Elenchus 
was based on an inadequate moral psychology and that genuine and lasting persuasion cannot be affected by refuting a person from his own beliefs. And by the time he wrote The Republic, he had come to believe that there was something radically wrong, not only with the Socratic Elenchus, but with the whole Socratic conception of philosophy. End quote. Beverslus produces as evidence for this claim a passage from Plato's Republic, which is well worth quoting in full. And this is the mouthpiece Socrates speaking. Quote, we hold from childhood certain convictions about just and fine things. We're brought up with them as with our parents. We obey and honour them. And then a questioner comes along and asks someone of this sort, what is the fine? And when he answers what he has heard from the traditional lawgiver, the argument refutes him, and by refuting him often and in many places, shakes him from his convictions and makes him believe that the fine is no more fine than shameful, and the same with the just, the good, and the things he honoured most. Then, when he no longer honours and obeys those convictions and can't discover the true ones, will he be likely to adopt any other way of life than that which matters him? And so, from being law-abiding, he becomes lawless. End quote. Beverslus reads this as Plato's tacit criticism of the Socrates of the early dialogues, who goes around indiscriminately refuting people. The refuted interlocutor in this passage, far from being motivated to become an inquirer, rather sinks into a kind of disillusionment and even a destructive moral nihilism. Beverslus goes on, In a word, philosophy is not for everyone. To reduce the theoretically unprepared and the emotionally unhabituated to the allegedly salutary state of mind called aporia is dangerous and ill-advised. Indeed, for such people, the experience of aporia is not salutary. It's the worst thing that could happen to them. End quote. While we need not entirely go along with Beverslus here, he does nevertheless raise a very important question, namely that of the proper relationship of the philosopher to the non-philosopher. I think we can safely say that going around refuting people willy-nilly would be an imprudent course of action for any philosopher, and for the reasons Beversus gives. However, the question as to whether this fairly describes Socrates' philosophical activities we should set aside for the moment. In summary, then, the Socratic Elenchus is undoubtedly effective in exposing and removing the conceit of knowledge. The immediate result of this removal is the state of aporia which is distressing for the interlocutor. In these earlier Socratic dialogues, we never see a refuted interlocutor converted into an inquirer, despite this being an aim of the Elenchus. This, in turn, prompts the question as to why the Elenchus fails to produce inquirers. But, given that the interlocutors of these early dialogues are not philosophers, it also prompts a deeper question concerning what should be the proper relationship between the philosopher and the non-philosopher.